Uh, today, Reggie and uh, Bob will be talking about our FNI Profit Recipe, five key ingredients, includes the right people, dealer commitment and management support, procedural guidelines for 100% solicitation, motivating pay plans, and proper training, of course. And they're going to go ahead and touch on FNI job description, five areas of responsibility. Underneath that, we have compliance and ethics, sales. We'll touch on management as well as administration, and then finally, financial. Just want to draw your attention to our uh, historical webinar series. Uh, all of these are available on agwsu.com forward slash webinars. So any presentation webinar um, that has come from the webinar series and f &I Insights can be found on our website. So we encourage you to look back historically on your own time. Those will all play on demand to you um, uh, when you have minutes. Uh, what we're going to do now is kick this over to both Bob and Reggie. So I'll hand it off to them. Bob Wentang, this is Bob Harkins. Could you please go back to the webinar series again? Yeah, that. sure. Okay. There you go. Just wanted to make a quick note about this. This is the uh, 13th webinar in our, web in our webinar series. We did uh, you know, four quarterly for 2019 and then uh, nine so far this year with the September uh, webinar. I will tell you that among those uh, 13, uh, we've had uh, AFIPS David Robertson. Most of you, many of you know Dave. Dave is the, uh, is the uh, president of AFIP and executive director. And uh, two of these 13 webinars that we've uh, received uh, a tremendous amount of feedback on, very positive for more information, for in leadership training, coaching and development, and getting the, the slide and other information to you, are, are two webinars that we did earlier this year. And I just want to mention the August 8th, 2020 webinar. And uh, that was the one where we were, we were talking about preloading products or services, preloading products or services. And the question is, is it legal uh, or illegal? And of course, we talked about uh, the fact that the answer to that question is yes, but it depends upon how you do it. Then we also got into uh, uh, to, to that uh, question with respect to uh, developing a dealership of value statement uh, as well. One of the things that came and questions we get with that webinar, recommendations, remember we can't give you legal advice, but preloading products and services, let's disclose the base vehicle only payment, as well as the vehicle as offered payment. And the VAO payment would be the payment the customer accepts after saying yes to the preloads. But then that VAO payment vehicle as offered payment now becomes the base payment as it relates to your menu, uh, your menu presentation. The other webinar that uh, tremendous amount of feedback on even through yesterday, because it's a hot button topic, was our May webinar, FNI Insights, uh, the FTC cooling off rule, vehicle sales made at home or at certain other locations, and also getting into the do's and don'ts of, uh, of electronic uh, signatures. And as you know, I hope you know, that with uh, vehicle sale, sales at home, certain other locations, uh, there's, there's a significant disclosure change with respect to uh, to those uh, to the to those sales. So with that, John, let's go to the areas of responsibility. Reggie and I will at attack this in just a few minutes. But what we have here is our handout: financial insurance, uh, five areas of responsibility, which we talk about in training, both in dealership, sales, coaching, and, and development, and also in our uh, our formal uh, offsite workshops that we conduct in Warrenville our home office is the job description or area of responsibilities of number one, compliance and ethics, number two, sales, number three, management, number four, admin or administration, number five, of course, is the financial function. So in a few minutes, we'll come back and take these apart and talk about several things under each one of those areas of responsibility. John, can we go to the profit recipe? All right, we're going to spend a lot of time on the profit recipe. And what does this say? When analyzing a finance and insurance department, it is necessary to evaluate the five key ingredients that determine profitability. When all ingredients are in place, maximum potential income can be achieved. When one is missing, it represents a severe profit leak. So when you think about it, if one is missing, it represents a severe profit leak. If two or more of these are missing, there will be a significant hemorrhage of potential F&I products and services. So the five areas of responsibility of this profit recipe 
and we're going to take it from uh, starting with the right people and then go uh, go clockwise. The right people, management support, procedural guidelines for 100% solicitation, motivating pay plans, and proper training. And the bottom line question: Are you maximizing your net dollar profit opportunity? So again, let me just uh, say hello to, to Reggie James with uh, Advanced Dealership Management Solutions. Reggie and I have had a chance to, to work together in, in stores in, 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 in Pennsylvania most recently. Does a great job with this profit recipe, also compliance and ethics. And uh, we're certainly very fortunate to have him with us, have him with us this afternoon. So Reggie, let's start with that first piece of the pie, the right people. And I know when you and I were together in Pennsylvania, you were actually doing some recruiting for that particular user group. But can you get us started on that, on just uh, how you do that and what you might want to share with us about the importance of the right people? Yes, uh, thank you, uh, John and Bob, for having me today. Uh, it's, uh, it's a privilege to be able to, to speak with you guys uh, today and, and, and work with the participants that are, uh, that are joining with us today. So the, the right people, you know, that is a... Um, you know, you can look at that as being kind of a, a vague uh, statement, or you could, you know, really drill down in that and really understand what uh, the, the right people mean. And let me start by talking about an analogy. And I, I like to use sports a lot when I, when I talk about a lot of things. You know, there are great individuals that play in the NFL, the NBA, and respective uh, <clears throat> sporting venues today. But let's just take football for a hot second. I think we can all, uh, we all know Peyton Manning was one of the all-time greatest quarterbacks to ever play uh, at that respective position. When we talk about the right people, you know, the right people does not mean just because that person has the ability to do something that they can do every single aspect of a respective job well they it doesn't mean that they can do every particular position or job you wouldn't take peyton manning and allow him to be a linebacker or to be a cornerback he was trained from the ground up as he grew over time to develop into the quarterback that he is today so the right people when it comes to to management teams, dealers, uh, partners in performance such as ourselves, Advanced DMS, and other partners that are out there, we have to <clears throat> figure out how do we identify the right people so we can maximize every particular opportunity that we have within the dealership. So when looking at the right people, do we take a look at sales associates? And because they sell a lot of cars or because they're successful month in and month out, does that mean that they can be a great F&I manager? Or does that mean that they have the potential to be a great sales manager? There are other things that you have to take a look at to see if this individual can be good at these things. So again, it takes a concerted effort from everyone within the dealership setting, partners in, the, in performance that you have working with you to help identify right people whether they are within your dealership or they are outside. So as Bob mentioned, uh, at this particular group uh, we were working at uh, in August, uh, I was in the midst of actually interviewing some personnel for different positions within the store. Uh, we ultimately did end up hiring somebody, but we went through a lot of candidates. And when we go through resumes, you, you weed out resumes and you kind of narrow it down to where you can get a group of individuals that you can have some phone conversations with, you move them to face-to-face -face interviews, then you kind of go back and you recircle again and, and talk about what has gone on. And then we try to drill down to find the right person. You know, is this person coachable? Does this person have experience within this respective position? You know, what are the expectations? Will they be able to meet the expectations? You know, there's, there are a lot of different things that we have to look at when identifying the right person for that respective job. Then there's always kind of a wild card. You may see somebody that just seems to have a lot of talent, a lot of potential, and you feel like you can develop that individual. And sometimes we can go that way as well. You know, it might be somebody that's within the dealership and we don't have to go outside to go and find somebody. But then 
there's vice versa where we don't have that individual that's within the store that we think can fit a respective position or an opening that we have in the dealership and we have to go outside. So there's a number of different ways that we have to look at this, a number of different windows that we have to kind of veer through to see where we need to identify the right personnel to, to be in the right position. Because ultimately, we're trying to find somebody that can get in that perspective seat and to produce in that position and ultimately grow into the next position. So the right people are very, very, very important. It's very easy to just put somebody and fill a seat, but if they're not productive, you know, you're just kind of spinning your wheels and just kind of going through the motions and ultimately not accomplishing the job that you want to accomplish. That's what I would say to you when I observed you doing that in Pennsylvania for those two days, just a, just a great job with that. And, and as we talk there and, and also since, so one of the things that we always talk about with the right people is, you know, what is their perception individually? What's their, possess, their perception of this dealership opportunity? Do they see it as a job only uh, or do they really see it as a career opportunity? And as you know, there's a big difference between the two and, and you really kind of kind of touched on it there. Uh, let's continue around the profit recipe for management support. And Reggie, I would throw in there the, the words as well, dealer commitment slash management support. support. You wanna tackle that for us, Reggie? Yeah, sure. So I, I like to look at management support and, you know, there, there, as you put dealer commitment, there's a very, very important piece right there when you say dealer commitment, dealer principle. The individual that owns dealer principle, managing partner, the individual who ultimately has the last say when it comes to making those decisions in that store, the owner, the president, that individual has to be committed to a, uh, a certain desire to want to be successful. Now, whatever their success level that they choose to, to, to have, so let's, let's talk about F&I specifically. If that particular dealer says, hey, I'm looking to run $1,500 a car across the board. I'm looking for 55% plus service contract penetration. I'm looking for 30% maintenance penetration. I'm looking for 50% uh, gap minute, uh, penetration and so on and so forth with regards to ancillary products. If that, individ if that person is committed to that mission, the next important piece of that equation is that that dealer communicates that information to his management team i.e. general manager, general sales manager, sales managers, F&I managers. The message needs to be consistent from the dealer from a commitment standpoint to a certain level of performance, and that information must be communicated effectively to the management team, and the management team must support that dealer's desired level of performance. And we have to uh, inspect what we expect on a daily basis from the dealer down to the last person that we have in that management team. Everyone has to be supportive of that dealer commitment that Bob spoke of early. That is so, so, so important. I have seen dealers or dealerships rather, let me say I have seen dealerships where there's no real defined expectation when it comes to what we're looking for in F&I or in the dealership as a whole. And sometimes that can be, you know, uh, a little difficult to deal with, especially from a, <clears throat> an agency standpoint or from a partner standpoint, when we're trying to help someone uh, get to a certain level. If the dealer is not committed to getting to a particular level and that information is not communicated to management support, we kind of have a bunch of people flying blind. And it's very difficult to work successfully in that setting because we don't know what the expectation is. So dealer commitment, management support, extremely important. Great job. When I was with you those two days, uh, of course the dealer, I didn't get a chance to be because he was on, on vacation, but I will tell you, you certainly have, and I could tell it that you had the dealer commitment and management support uh, as well for the things that we were doing in those days, which was together doing compliance and ethics training. And, and so much so that what we really did was uh, followed uh, the, the, the dealer's 
uh, agenda for what he want, want covered that day. So the dealer sets the agenda for all of the, the training that we do in dealership as far as the, the, the training, coaching, and development. One of the things that I like to talk about also is the dealer commitment and management support for the ever popular 400% rule. We've heard that before. That is 100% of our customers are presented 100% of our products 100% of the time with 100% legal and ethical compliance. Uh, Reggie, let's move around the horn to procedural guidelines for 100% solicitation. Uh, the importance of that and, and how you're accomplishing that or, or working to accomplish, accomplish that with your, uh, with, with your uh, dealer partners. So, you know, procedural guidelines, I mean, you, you know, I, I use the, the term inspect what you expect. So, you know, we've talked about having the right people. We've talked about management support. So when we, so I, I'm kind of going to build something here. So when we talk about the dealer commitment, he has a very defined level of expectation that he's trying to meet for performance. That information there is communicated to management, you know, to the general managers, general sales managers in our respective stores. You know, do we have the right people supporting that? You know, and when I say, do we have the right people? Have they been trained appropriately? Did we identify the right people that are, and are they trained appropriately? Have we uh, communicated the messaging when it comes to what we're trying to get accomplished on a daily basis in that dealership? So then we talk about our procedural guidelines. You know, do we have the right processes in place within the dealership, within the F&I setting to make sure that we are accomplishing uh, our goals accordingly. You know, there's a there's a, a gentleman back in the day, and Bob, I know you know this name, Jackie Cooper. Yes, you know, sir. He, he talked about this being a, a I don't want to minimize this, but he talked about it being a numbers game for sales associates, you know, and that you had to make sure that you were seeing enough people and that one out of every four individuals that you meet and you have properly uh, done your steps to the sale, you've gone through the process appropriately, and that process that you're going through is a clearly defined process from a sales associate standpoint that one out of every four people you should be selling a vehicle to. He said it in a different way. He said that one out of every four people should be paying you in some form or fashion or compensating you. So when it comes to F&I with regards to procedural guidelines, Bob asked the question, how are we doing things to make sure things are happening? So we make sure that we have a process in place where there is an interview 100% of the time with every single customer, that we are doing a strong menu presentation with every single customer 100% of the time. You know, our team, whether it's myself uh, or other members of our team, we can go in and check these things. Are, are we sure that we have an interview being done? <clears throat> are we sure that a menu is being done? We have a procedure in our stores where our menus, we are actually, we have our accounting teams that actually check to see if a menu is in the deal. We have missing menu logs in place to make sure that the menus are being done uh, appropriately. Um, when it comes to procedural guidelines, when it comes to things being done uh, morally and ethically, are we making sure that we're utilizing checklists? Are we making sure that we are <clears throat> um, doing our things with regards to, to compliance? Uh, we have, and Bob, you know Amy. Amy has done a really good job of defining our procedures with regards to the responsibilities of individuals when it comes to procedural guidelines. And we are very effective in making sure that these things are getting done. Because that will slide back to management support and also sliding back to the right people, that once we put these things in place, do we have the right people in here in place to make sure that we are effectively following the guidelines? Because also procedural guidelines, when you don't do something for one person that you're doing with the other people that you're doing, that can also lead to a piece where you could find yourself in trouble if somebody comes back and they're taking a look at deals, if you have some litigation going on and things of that nature, so procedural guidelines are extremely important that we follow, you know, to make sure we're maximizing profit, CSI, compliance, ethics, 
very important. Very good, Reggie. Thank you so much for mentioning uh, Amy and his reference to that is uh, Amy Zilke Huff. We've had the opportunity, I have personally, to work with her the past uh, year and a half or so. Does a, a great job with this, and she's part of the Advanced Leadership Management uh, Solutions team. And just uh, uh, echo what uh, what Reggie said about about this. You know, Reggie, you and I talked about this before. I think with this uh, profit recipe or or wheel, whatever. And in my uh, uh, time as a as a sales instructor and and working with stores on a direct basis as a street manager and that kind of thing. We used to call them, we still call them routing procedures. But I hated to write routing procedures. I was not a good author of those things. But, but to do them right is to do them right and they really pay off. So a routing procedure or writing those processes is basically, basically who does what, when do they do it, and a little bit of the why. Who does what, when do they do it, and, and just a little bit of the why. The big picture why is, you know, ultimately we all report to somebody. And uh, somebody's going to point the finger at somebody because you didn't do this, you didn't do that. One of the things that, that we teach and talk about, and I learned a long time ago about routing procedures, who does what, uh, when do they do it, and a little bit of the why, is documentation beats conversation. Think about that, folks. Documentation beats, beats conversation. Reggie, we've got to move the motivating pay plan. I like to think of that as uh, the FM radio station, W-I-I-F-M, the call letters, which, of course, uh, stands for what's in it for me. And uh, would you kind of talk about uh, pay plans and just uh, in general, and maybe a specific example of one or two that, that you see or, or have in your stores? And are you working with your uh, your dealer clients with uh, developing uh, them on a regular basis, Reggie? Yes, absolutely. Um, another uh, very important piece in this uh, profit recipe is having a motivating pay plan. So. This takes, uh, it's a delicate balancing act when you're building a pay plan. So again, I, I keep shifting back to certain things. So when we talk about the dealer commitment and management support, so when focusing in on the dealer or the individual who is uh, writing or putting together compensation plans for the respective positions in the store, you know, the first thing that needs to be identified is what are we trying to get accomplished from a performance standpoint? Pay plans in dealership settings should always be performance based. Performance based. Two important words when building a pay plan. So when a dealer says to myself or to any one of our members of the team, especially when we're looking at um, potentially bringing on new clients and we're in that courting stage of, of getting a new deal, you know, this is one of the areas of conversation that we have, you know, uh, let's go back to that $1,500 a car from a PVR standpoint and the service contract penetration at 55% and the other products at the respective uh, uh, desired levels that the dealer wants. It is our responsibility at that point, if the dealer invites us or would like for us to do so, to build a pay plan that one meets or exceeds the dealer's expectation. And then secondly, we want to build a pay plan that also is motivating to that respective business manager. You know, so there, here we're, we're going to go right back to this right people again. You know, we have to be very conscious of the right people. You know, if the dealer's looking for $1,500, $1,600 a car, when we first bring in an F&I manager into that particular equation, we have to keep that in, in, in mind here. Is that the right person for that job when we're, when we're building this pay plan? So we have to build pay plans, again, from the dealer and his desired level of expectation. We have to build the pay plan that's performance-based around those numbers where we specifically look at those components. You may have a dealer that's just looking for a PVR number and he might just be looking for service contracts. So we focus on building the service contract, I mean the uh, pay plan around those respective uh, performance metrics. You may have a dealer that says, hey, I'm looking for 60% of my income to come from product and 40% of my income to come from reserve. We may have to build a pay plan where we split up how we pay off of the uh, total PVR number or the total gross number with regards to how the product penetration is going 
and how the compensation is coming from reserve income. So we have to look at those things internally once the dealer says, hey, this is what I'm looking for, guys. I want you to help me build this pay plan. And at the same time, we have to put that pay plan together that is motivating to that respective business manager to help maximize the performance in that, uh, within that pay plan. We also have to make sure that when we're building that pay plan and we're making it motivating for that uh, respective F&I manager, we have to focus in on you know, making sure we've got caveats in there so they can push you know, the performance to the level that that respective dealer is looking for. Pay plans are, are an essential part uh, within the dealership to make sure that we are being successful in, in every way. And conversely, if we're not performing, if we're not performing in our respective position, the pay plan will reflect that as well. Very good, Reggie. Excellent points there. I would stay with this uh, just a thought. You mentioned that fifteen hundred dollars a car, and that's a note that I've written down with uh, respect to my comments here. You know, somebody somebody would say to you, "Well, fifteen hundred a car is that the goal? Is that a good job?" Or they might say to you, "Hey, Bob, I'm doing fifteen hundred dollars a car, dollar per retail unit rate of travel, whatever." all those terms they've used over the years, is that a good job? And, and I'll tell you, quite frankly, I don't know if it's a, if it's a good job or not. So you know, I would come back and ask a couple of questions. Number one, and you, and you alluded to this, and I think it's right on, of that uh, $1,500 a car, what percent of that is finance reserve? What percent of that is finance reserve? And if they don't know, that's a problem, number one. But if they come back and say, well, probably 60, 65, 70% or anything over 50, I would certainly uh, question really, is it, is, is it a good job? And I would probably say anything over, uh, you know, uh, 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 over 40 with that, because you know, I, I want the majority of that income coming from, from the products, because that's what brings the customer back, back to the store. It's not the, uh, the, the annual percentage rate, unless it's, unless it's a zero, zero APR. You also mentioned uh, counting and performance with respect to uh, you know, 65% penetration on this and 55 on that or whatever it is. One of the things that I found to be very, very beneficial, a lot of stores use it, many don't, and I refer to it as PSPRS and also PSPCL. Uh, PSPRS stands for product sold for retail sale. You talk about the buck stops here, this measures the performance of the individual. Product sold for retail sale. Now in a store that's doing quite a bit of leasing, I would show a separate uh, uh, a figure for leasing, that would be PSPCL, product sold per, consu per uh, con consumer lease. So in addition to measuring the penetration numbers, dollar per car, let's measure PSPRS or PSPCL. So for example, if I have the five retail sales, and among those five retail sales, I've sold 10 products, pretty easy math, 10 divided by five is two. My PSPRS is two. On the other hand, if I have uh, another set of five retail sales, and among those five retail sales, the total number of products sold was three, three divided by five is 0.6. So what's your, your goal, what's your game plan for products sold for retail sale or products sold for consumer lease? And it ties that individual, uh, 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 individual financial services manager uh, to that performance. Real quickly, and we've got to move on, you were using the term motivation obviously with respect to motivating pay plan. And, and, and uh, in, in class, if you've been to our, our four-day workshop or three-and-a-half-day workshop, you've heard me say this, but let me just mention it, it, it quickly. Uh, and that's motivators and inhibitors. And the bottom line is what motivates people and then what are, what are inhibitors? I'm not a, a good reader. I don't like to read whatever, but I'm on an airplane a lot, so I, I read certain things. And a number of years ago, this is a combination of books written by uh, Tom Hopkins, Zig Ziglar, and, and also Ken Blanchard. And most of this came from uh, Ken Blanchard and, and Tom Hopkins. But I remember the bottom right-hand corner of the page on motivation uh, was the question, uh, or it said, what motivates people is. At the bottom right-hand corner of the page said, what motivates people is, and to get the answer, you had to turn the page. So when I turned the page, top left-hand corner, it said, what motivates people? I was kind of disappointed because I didn't get it right away. But the bottom line, think about this. What motivates people is what motivates people. And it's different with different people. But real quickly, the seven motivators, but primarily from Tom Hopkins and Ken Blanchard, and I'm not listing these or giving them to you in order of uh, importance, because that's going to vary by individual, but I'm giving it to you on how I committed it to memory. So real quickly, the seven motivators. Number one is money. Number two is achievement. 
Number three is recognition. Number four is security. Number five is love of family. Number six is acceptance of others. And number seven is self-acceptance. So number one, money. Two, achievement. Three, recognition. Four, security. Five, love of family. Six, acceptance of others. And seven is self-acceptance. So but I remember Blanchard and Hopkins specifically talking about that. When you do one-on-ones with people about what motivates them, typically for almost everybody, the number one answer is, is not money. It's almost never money. Number one answer is things like achievement, a recognition and security. So as we work with our people in the stores, it's kind of nice to know what motivates people is what motivates people. So what are their motivators? To be fair, if you talk about motivators, as Hopkins and Blanchard talked about, you better be talking about the inhibitors as well. And the four top inhibitors of motivation all go four, three, two, and one. Number four is self-doubt. Man, I don't think I can do that. Number two is fear of failure. Well, you know, even if I tried, I'm, I'm certain it wouldn't be, be successful for me. It wouldn't work for me. Uh, number two, after self-doubt and fear of failure, is loss of security. So because of that and not being successful, uh, my income uh, would, would drop and security for myself and my family. But by far, the number one reason, our number one inhibitor to motivation is three words, ladies and gentlemen. And those three words are pain and change. Pain and change. The pain and change that it takes to learn and try something new. Uh, Reggie, wrap up this uh, profit recipe for us. There's a reason why proper training is uh, at the bottom, the, the base or the foundation, but, but take us through that piece of the pie, Reggie. Yeah, so I, I like to call that partner and performance support um, as, a, as, a, as a subtopic there. You know, if, if the team is not, so let, let's back up the right people again. So when we identify the right person, Okay, when we identify the right person and the message has been communicated them from the dealer on down. So follow me here. The, the message has been communicated on what the expectation is. Okay, we've set processes in place uh, with regards to procedural guidelines. We have the pay plan in place to hopefully motivate that person to be successful in that position. And now we've moved to, to proper training. So I hope everyone's kind of following how this recipe kind of works here. The proper training piece is important. We've identified the right person to go in the job. Have we trained that person appropriately? Are they getting training from the respective partner in performance or the agency uh, or that respective district manager for that area? Is that person going in and spending time with them? Uh, to make sure that they can do the things that they need to do in F&I. You know, can they run and work the DMS as they need to? Do they know how to work their, their menus appropriately? Do they know how to present their menus appropriately? Do they know how to, to interview appropriately? Do they know their word tracks? Do they understand their word tracks? Really big one here. Do you know your products? Do you know what your products are? Do you know what the features, advantages, and benefits of those uh, products are? You know, uh, there are a number of measures when it comes to properly training uh, an, an individual to make sure that they are uh, uh, fully equipped to manage their day-to-day -day business. And so you can have the most uh, veteran of individuals that, they sometimes can forget certain things or forget to do certain things. I think Bob was, uh, I'm sorry, Bob was not at this meeting with us, but one of my uh, latest meetings at one of my uh, dealer groups, uh, excuse me, Bob, I went to Pennsylvania right after you and I were up there. It was like back to back. But yes, one of the things I had a, vet, I had a veteran F&I manager in there who does a really good job, but he did not have a great month. And so, it's very easy to see what's going on. And so when we go back and we talk about procedural guidelines, you can always find something within this recipe to find out where the, where the crook is or where the, the chink in the armor is. So this respective business manager who runs $1,500, $1,500 a car every single month, month in, month out, this particular month, he ran right around $1,100 just below that, which is well below his level of, expect of, of, of expectation. Well, my team goes in, we take a look at the, um, the missing menu log, and sure enough, he didn't have some menus in there. So when we don't have menus in there, it leads us back to this next question. Hey, ma'am, sir, 
Did you do 100% interviews with all customers? I'm seeing that you're missing menus. You know what, Reggie? I, I didn't do interviews 100% of the time. I was in a hurry. You know, we, I didn't have time to do this or I didn't have time to do that. And so that's where you find the chinks in the armor. And so we then go back and we train on those things again. You know, hey, it's important. It's the policy. It's the expectation that you have to do an interview 100% of the time, regardless of the circumstances. So now we go back to management support. Are the sales managers rushing them to get the job done? Are they not allowing them the, the proper time to do what they need to do? So we have to go back to that management support. Sometimes we have to go all the way back to the dealer to make sure that that message is being communicated appropriately to make sure that that individual is doing what they need to do. So that is a very important part of the training. Do we, one, we want to make sure that we've got the right person. We want to make sure that they're trained from the ground up appropriately, and we have procedures in place and how, on how we systematically do that with each one of our respective business managers that we have in our rooftops. And then along the way, we have to make sure that they're following the guidelines to make sure that they're doing the things that they need to do. Because whenever performance falls out of pocket, there's always something that you can go back to to find out where what was missing at that point. And then we can go back and we can retrain as, as needed. That's excellent. And what that really was, when you think about it, is uh, those, those guidelines, but it's that phrase, documentation beats conversation. That gentleman was able to tell you exactly what the problem was or problems were, and then able to address it to, to correct that for the, for the next for the next month or pay period, whatever. So the five pieces of pie. Let's wrap up this profit recipe again with that uh, comment at the bottom or question: Are you maximizing your net dollar profit opportunity? Are you maximizing your net dollar profit opportunity? And a dealer group, a particular dealer, this goes back to the mid 1980s and knew them really through uh, probably 2005, 2006. And he would say, hey, don't tell me how much we're putting up. I could care less about growths. Tell me how much we're keeping. How much are we keeping after chargebacks, uh, refunds, cancellations, and pay plans? So the phrase that he used, and we've heard it, heard it in the industry for many years, is basically this. F&I gross is vanity. F&I net is sanity. F&I gross is vanity, but F&I net is sanity. Don't tell me how much uh, we're putting up. Tell me how much we're keeping after chargebacks, refunds, and cancellations, and a respective pay plan. So are you maximizing your net dollar profit opportunity? When all ingredients are in place, maximum potential income can be achieved. When one or more than one is missing, it represents a severe profit leak. Reggie, great job with that. We got to move from a time standpoint. John, would you go to the areas of responsibility? The areas of responsibility? There we go, we'll stop on that. Uh, Reggie, I asked you to, to maybe make a comment or two about uh, uh, any of these five, but you know, uh, pick a couple of those areas. We don't have time to do justice uh, in depth with any one of the five, but uh, take us through uh, what your comments are in any of those five and how you're accomplishing those with your, um, with your dealer clients, your dealer partners. Yes, yeah, so I, I'll just pick a couple of these um, that, that kind of stand out and something ha hit me uh, as a matter of fact, on our my last opportunity I had to spend with Bob, I, I have to tell everyone this that's listening, that Bob is one of the best uh, trainers when it comes to compliance and ethics that I have ever seen in my 25 plus year career in this automotive industry. Uh, he, is an out, he is an outstanding resource when it comes to compliance and ethics, and it made me do a gut check myself on compliance and ethics. You know, when we look at compliance and ethics and we look at um, some of the subtopics that we, we have in here, you know, such as um, the seven deadly sins of F&I, you know, and, and the seven deadly sins are, you know, using the word best when quoting an APR, forging signatures, overstating income, non-compliant menu sales, uh, payment packing, non-compliant disclosure, and ex excessive buy rates. And, and then when we talk about those, those things, uh, also, with some of the other things like um, red flags, you know, OFAC, uh, adverse action notices, and the, and the list goes on. You know, one of the things that has changed significantly over time, and this is what I was thinking about when Bob did this last presentation for our group, one of our groups, was how easy it is for us not to pay attention 
to compliance and ethics sometimes because of things like dealer track compliance suites or route one compliance suites. I'm not saying that they're not good tools. They are awesome tools for us to, to uh, have and to utilize. But are we truly utilizing those things to make sure that we're benefiting the dealership? So we mentioned Amy Zinke Huff. One of the things that she does for us is she will go into our stores and she will take a look at uh, our compliance dashboards with dealer track and with route one. You would be amazed at times how much we're missing, how much we're not paying attention to. And that's because we have gotten so used to technology today the use of the internet, the use of our cell phones, the use of, of PCs. And, you know, I would challenge each and every one of you that are listening today to ask yourself, am I really current when it comes to compliance and ethics today? And if you take a look at each one of those points in there, you know, uh, do you understand F&I and the law? Do you know the seven, seven deadly ascends? Are you truly familiar with the IRS cash reporting rule and the different nuances of that? Bob has a quiz that he could offer to any one of you to see if you truly are uh, knowledgeable when it comes to that. F&I best practices, code of ethics, the 400% rule that we talked about. You know, educate yourself, read these materials, you know, and make sure that you are up to date when it comes to compliance and ethics and don't get caught in that trap thinking that dealer track and or route one does everything for us because that is not the case. You still must be current when it comes to compliance and ethics. Uh, I'm going to just turn that back over to Bob because I, I know he probably has some things to say about compliance and ethics. Well, just a thought. We're almost at that time to get back to, to John Friedland, but I will tell you in, in a subsequent uh, webinar or two, we'll do uh, a much more comprehensive job on the areas of responsibility and spend uh, plenty of time on sales management, admin, and the financial financial function. One thing with respect to uh, compliance and ethics, you know, those of you that, that, that potentially go to, uh, to uh, the NADA on a regular basis, or even if you don't, I would encourage you to go to the NADA website, the National Automobile Dealers Association website. Uh, go to nada.org and forward slash regulatory affairs and pull up uh, the regulatory maze. The regulatory maze. This is uh, NADA's annual update on federal regulations. And I get mine every year at the NADA convention. So what I'm gonna share with you is what I got a few months back, I guess it was February at the NADA convention in, um, in, in, in Las Vegas. And every time I get this, before I open it up, I say to myself, is this the year finally when it comes to just federal laws, not state, local or county, whatever, but just federal regulations, is this gonna be the year where that number exceeds uh, triple digits? because it kind of dangled around that, that number for the past three or four years. So I got it this year, opened it up and did a quick count and lo and behold, there it was. 103, ladies and gentlemen, 103 of federal laws and regulations that we are under the umbrella of and have to comply with as a new car dealership, new car dealer organization uh, in, in America. So even with what we think is a comprehensive job that we do in our classes, both uh, formal in, in, in Chicago and Warrenville, or when I come and work with, with Reggie and our other agent partners and Peter clients, and we do you know, three hour sessions or hour and a half sessions or full day sessions, whatever on compliance and ethics, we really only scratch the surface. You never get through everything. And, 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 and in a good session, maybe we're touching on maybe 10 max of these FTC regulations and federal laws. Now, they're the ones that are capable of taking us down on a regular basis, but in the grand scheme of things, we're just only touching or scratching the surface. But again, it's been great to work with Reggie, members of his team at, at Advanced DMS, Leadership Management Solutions, with Ralph Bynes and his team, and, and Amy is just, uh, just, uh, just great to work with and everyone in that organization. Reggie, thank you for joining us today. Great job. Great uh, contribution. We're going to have you back for, for more of these. But again, as I yield back to John to close this out today, everything that we do from an American Guardian group of companies standpoint is to help our agent partners and dealer clients to maximize deal profit. Deal profit being both front end growth and financial insurance income, but as always to do it the right way. And the right way is in a manner that's consistent with good customer relations and sound business practices. Mr. Friedland, John. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Reggie. Appreciate it. All right, uh, moving forward, our webinar schedule uh, for the remainder of the 2020. 
um, is there in front of you. So the next one is uh, scheduled for October 14th. Um, that'll also be at uh, 1 o'clock Central, uh, 2 o'clock Eastern. Uh, please feel free to uh, check us out on LinkedIn and uh, click us as a follower. Uh, we do put out uh, bits of information on that uh, periodically, um, some nice links about the industry and uh, uh, different things that are going on. And then again, here's our webinar series going forward. And all of that is available on our website, so I'd, I'll direct you there. Uh, to I'm going to stay on that too. Again, ladies and gentlemen, if you want help with that, if I can assist you with uh, a Zoom meeting or webinar on that or be with you in person, be happy to do so. And, and you're certainly capable of doing these things yourself, but these as a guide uh, from myself and or Dave, Dave Robertson, and now with Reggie James uh, as well. John? Yeah. Thank you, Bob. Yep. And then our contact information there is at the bottom. Uh, feel free to reach out to Bob Harkins or myself uh, with any questions. All right. Well, thank you very much for joining today. I uh, really appreciate it. Thank you all for your time. And um, the recording will be available also on our website here shortly. Thanks again, everyone. Have a great Thanks, day.